Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, good evening. <laughs> and this was fun for me. I studied for seven years theology, both Protestant and Catholic theology. So I spent much of my life studying Latin and Greek and all kind of theology. And I haven't done anything with that in over 30 years. So when I suggested to Michelle, um, how about doing a lecture on Saint Bernard? I thought, hmm, that's going to be interesting. All right. So this is a little bit from my past, although I never studied Saint Bernard before. I, I am a theologian by training before I got my PhD in history, in religious history. Okay, so, so long before Marie Laveau, there was theology. All right. <laughs> the title is, Who for Heaven's Sake Was Saint Bernard? All right. Saint Bernard Parish is named for Saint Bernard, right? We all know that, but what do we know about that Saint Bernard after whom our great parish is named? Uh, Saint Bernard Parish, La Parroquia de San Bernardo, founded March 31st, 1803, is named for Bernardo de Galvez, who founded this area and brought the Canary Islanders here. Everyone in southern Louisiana knows who St. Joseph was. On his feast day, we all know, right, March 19th, on his feast day, we have beautiful altars everywhere. He was a hard worker and by profession a carpenter who built houses, the, B the Bible says. Uh, hence, when we need a job, we ask for help. We ask him for help. And we all know what to do when we want to sell or buy a house, right? We go to him and ask him for his intercession. Ah, I'm suspecting some of us here have had a Saint Anthony, I'm sorry, a Saint Joseph upside down somewhere in the yard of a house that we were supposed to sell. Or <laughs> yeah, everything works. All the uh, real estate uh, professionals tell me he works like a charm. Okay, um, we all know. This lady, Our Lady of Prompt Socor, our patron saint in Louisiana, who saved us from the Great Fire of 1788, and then again from the British in the winter of 1814 and 15. Ha, ah, yeah, well, we talk about that every January, and of course we all know she saved us from the British. Uh, here we have St. Louis, King of France. Our cathedral is named for him. There we have two images of him. That's Louis the Ninth, uh, a medieval king of France that went to the Holy Land to get the uh, Holy Land back from from um, the Muslim regime there. So we find him. Uh, the whole cathedral is named for him. Uh, in fact, Louisiana is named for him because Louis the Fourteenth, the great king under whose regime Louisiana was claimed for France. His patron saint was this man here. Okay. Ha, we know her. She is Saint Joan of Arc, the patron saint of France, who delivered France from the British. And of course, we have her next to the French market. This is her statue that's in the cathedral. And there we have Saint Rita. Oh God, we know Saint Rita. She uh, was the patron saint of the impassable, of abused wives and marriage. And she had a, uh, the light of Jesus came to her, so she has a stigmata on her forehead. So yeah, we have her everywhere here in Louisiana. Of course, we know St. Anthony. If anything gets lost, we know St. Anthony is our man. He's going to bring it back to us. So works on, let's go back to him, uh, works on, St. Anthony works on four keys when they're lost, works for purses, and also works on a husband or a wife. So you get him back too with a novena to St. Anthony. Okay, now here we have St. Expedite. When we want to get something done fast, that's our man. We all know how to pray for him. There is a shrine for him in, in New Orleans. We know St. Anne, right? When young ladies looking for a significant other, they pray, Saint Anne, Saint Anne, give me a man. So. And of course, Saint Jude. 
His big shrine is in Our Lady of Guadalupe at Rampart Street in New Orleans, and he is the saint of impossible cases. God knows every one of us has had him sometimes in his life, uh, at least all of us Catholics here. St. Jude is very important and really helps you when you're in trouble. All right. Who is this? <laughs> now, who is St. Bernard? Who, for heaven's sake, was he? And what, if anything, can he do for the faithful Catholic? Why don't we have St. Bernard statues and prayer cards everywhere? And there are a few churches named for him here in St. Bernard Parish. Is he good for anything? Why is St. Bernard Parish named for him? But he's hardly ever mentioned here. This lecture will provide us with an introduction to his life and legacy. Okay, now let's look into him. Ha! <laughs> St. Bernard Dogs. Does he have a... Does he have anything to do with these guys here? Well, when we think Saint Bernard, usually the first thing that comes to mind is a dog like that. A giant, beautiful dog with a little barrel of brandy around the neck, who is trained to find and rescue avalanche victims in the Alps. That's what they do, and they are huge. The elixir in the bottle is supposed to bring the victims miraculously back to life. The Saint Bernard is a breed of very large walking dogs from the Western Alps. They were originally bred for alpine rescue by the hospice of the Great Saint Bernard Pass, uh, located near the border between Switzerland and Italy. The hospice, which was built by and named after an Italian monk named Saint Bernard, started breeding these dogs since the 17th century. The it was Bernard of Menthon. The, the, uh, this gorgeous, these gorgeous animals have become famous for their amazing search and rescue abilities, as well as their enormous size. So if you want a real big dog, get this one. But we don't see a lot around here because we don't have a whole lot of avalanches, right? So when we look around here in south eastern Louisiana, there are no snowy mountains. And we have no needs for, lost to, for rescuing lost mountaineers. So let's look in our history. Let's go back to Bernardo de Galvez in Madrid. Okay, Don Bernardo. Most of us here know that St. Bernard Parish was named for the patron saint of Don Bernardo's Bernardo de Galvez in Madrid, the superstar among the nine Spanish governors of colonial Louisiana. It was under Don Bernardo that this, settl that this settlement just below, meaning downriver from New Orleans, was founded. The Crescent City was then the capital of the vast Louisiana ter territory that reached from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Canada. And it was Don Bernardo here that named the new settlement uh, the Saint Bernard District for his personal patron saint, Saint Bernard, which later, after the Louisiana Purchase, became St. Bernard Parish during the early American time. Okay. Don Bernardo was the first Spanish governor of Louisiana. Later on, he moved on to be the Viceroy of Spain. He, I'm sorry, New Spain. New Spain was huge. When you look at, at the map, it was... Um, it reached from the Gulf of Mexico to Alaska. It reached in South America down to Colombia. It included the Philippines and much of the Caribbean. It was really a huge territory that was under him. So the great, the great uh, Don Bernardo, um, where am I? Um, he was really, really important for uh, the, this beautiful Louisiana and for the United States. So not only, not only uh, did he help Spain immensely, he helped the United States. Without him, there would be no United States of America. That's wh why we have people in Louisiana that are daughters and sons of the American Revolution, because it was him who cited, well, it was the Spanish government, but he represented the Spanish government in North America. He uh, fought 
three battles that chased the British ultimately out of the Gulf of Mexico. The Battle of, Mo of Baton Rouge, then he uh, defeated them in Mobile, Alabama. Ultimately, the siege of Pensacola was what decided the fate of the British in the Gulf of Mexico. So he was really important for us, not just as St. Bernard Parish uh, members or citizens, but also as American citizens. Now it gets complicated. Who was the patron saint of Don Bernardo de Galvez? There are seven San Bernards in the Catholic Church. Can you believe it? I was quite surprised. The Catholic Church, the great religion, I'm a Catholic, has a saint for every occasion. And with San Bernard, we have a lot of them. Look at that. Seven, seven San Bernards. It's quite amazing to see all of them. And we all, we also, they have something in common, except for the last one who came from Corleone. <laughs> You've heard that before. <laughs> he was Sicilian. The others all lived in what we call the Middle Ages, medieval time. We have like three ages, antiquity, Middle Ages, and modernity. So they were all medieval characters, and almost all of them followed, I know I think they all did, followed the Benedictine orders. So they had, uh, they had a very strict, uh, monastic life. Okay, now we can't go over all of them, so I might just pick two that are important. Number two, because we talked about the dogs, I might tell, tell you a little bit about him, and then we go to the ultimate superstar, and of course, if the superstar among our nine Spanish governor was a superstar and then became the viceroy, voice, the viceroy of Spain, well, God knows he must have a real superstar among for his patron saint, it's Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. So now, let's go to the first one. Wait, here we go. Saint Bernard of Monson. Saint Bernard of Monson, in Italian, San Bernardo di Mentone, was an Italian monk who lived in the uh, 11th century in the borderland between France, Italy, and Switzerland in the Western Alps. He was the founder of the famous St. Bernard Hospice and Monastery, which is named for him and has served travelers for nearly a millennium as a refuge in one of the most dangerous parts of the Alps. The St. Bernard do dogs were named after St. Bernard's Hospice, where the monks were developing this very special breed of dogs that is uniquely capable of rescuing travelers from snow and ice. All right. That's pretty, huh? <laughs> That's the Chateau de Monton, Saint Bernard. Okay. Saint Bernard was born around, oops, around 1020 in the Chateau of Monton, right here. Not bad, huh? It's near Annecy in France. He was the son of a very rich nobleman. When he reached adulthood, he had a calling from God and decided to devote himself to the service of the church. But his wealthy father had none of that. He had other plans for him and arranged for an appropriate marriage with a well-to-do, fine, young, noble lady. But Bernard refused. He escaped, he escaped from the castle instead. Now, I'm not sure from which window he jumped, but he jumped with of one of those windows. <laughs> so uh, it was one of the higher ones because he jumped 40 feet. So, so when he jumped out of that window, the legend has it, the angel sent by God carried him safely on his 40 feet jump and brought him to the church where he became a priest, a monk and an archdeacon. Okay, his main mission, we have to see the castle to understand <laughs> that legend. So, um, and see, it, it's right over the lake. So from this castle, you can see the whole lake. It's quite beautiful. So um, his main mission of this Saint Bernard de Monton became to convert pagan people, quote, quote, of the high Alps. At that time, there were many people in the Alps not converted to Christianity. So he was converting pre-Christian indigenous ethnic people in the Alps to Roman Catholicism. 
And apparently this Bana was very good at that. He had much su success with preaching the gospel and working miracles. Now let's go to that hospice that's named for him. Aha. Uh -huh. Has anyone here ever been there? No. Okay, yeah, if you want to go through the Alps, you had to go through this pass because it's at the highest, between the highest mountain ranges in the Alps. On this side is the Santa Rosa Mountains, and on that side is the Mont Blanc. Those are the two highest mountains, mountain ranges of the Alps. So St. Bernard's district included the dreaded pass through the Western Alps near the border between Italy and Switzerland, where French and German pilgrims had, they had to come through here when they crossed the mountains on their way to Rome. So all the pilgrimages to Rome had to go over that pass. There was no other way to get through the Alps. At its highest point, the pass is 8,000 feet above the sea level. It's quite high. And it's covered with perpetual snow seven to eight feet high. I was told at some times of the year there can be drifts up to 40 feet high. So it's a dangerous place. It's extremely dangerous in the springtime when we have avalanches in the Alps. So in the year 1050, St. Bernard made history by establishing the famous hostel and monastery that bears his name at this location to protect the travelers. So to this day, the pass is known as the St. Bernard Pass because his hospice was up there. He died in 1081, uh, and he was canonized in 1681 by Pope Innocent XI. So now not only the pilgrims crossed the Alps at this spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some of you know this image. One of the originals, it's made by David, and a, a French painter. One of these was actually, or st I think still is, in the Cabildo in uh, New Orleans. So yeah, Napoleon Bonaparte had to cross the Alps also over this pass. You see the pass in the background here. It's the same pass. So we see him here high on the horse. He leads his troops heroically over the famous St. Bernard Pass, right between the highest mountain ranges. But we know the truth. Napoleon did not ride the pass on a horse. He was on a little donkey, because horses cannot ride that pass. So this is all propaganda, what we see here. But it shows us the importance of this pass that's named for him. Um, now let's look at that Saint Bernard again. Our Saint Bernard here, Saint Bernard de Menton, uh, or of Menton, is the patron saint of mountaineers, skiers, snowboarding, backpacking, and the Alps. Ah, nope, that's not our saint. We're not looking for him. It's not likely that Don Bernardo de Galvez, the founder of this great parish, who was born and raised in Mal near Malaga in the south of Spain, had much to do with skiers and snowboarding. Nope. So let's look to someone else. I already told you, this is our man. That's the man we're looking for. He was a French monk and an abbot and a major spiritual leader in the medieval time, reforming the Benedictine, mon Benedictine monasti monasticism. Uh, he was one of the most important men anywhere on earth in that time. He was more important than the popes who lived at his time, more important than the kings that lived at his time. He was a crucial crucial character of, the, uh, of all of medieval Europe. He left an incredible theological and spiritual legacy for centuries to come. And since I'm not an expert of him, I can just introduce you to him a little bit today. He is venerated not only in the Catholic Church, he's also venerated by the Anglican Church and the Lutheran Church for good reasons. Let's look into his life. Saint Bernard was born into a noble family again. His parents were Teslin de Fontaine, 
the Lord of Fontaine les Dijon. And his mom was Alette de Montbard. Both of them were members of the highest nobility of Burgundy. So he was um, coming from a very, very good family. Bernard was the third of seven children, six of whom were sons, only one girl. At the age of nine years, he was sent to a secular school at Châtillon-sur-Seine. Bernard was a good student. He had a great taste for literature and devoted himself to poetry. His success won him the admiration of his teachers, but early on, his yearning for deep spiritual life became evident. And he knew very early that his calling in life was to become a contemplative monk. So at that, we will see he had a lifelong special relationship with the Holy Mother, the Virgin Mary. He would later write several works about the Queen of Heaven. At age 22, he started living a strictly religious life after the death of his mom, his mother. In 1112, he decided to take his vows in the Abbey of Sisto, famous for its religious rigor at the time. And when he joined the monks, he didn't arrive by himself. No, he was a very charismatic character. He was so persuasive that he brought 30 men with him when he took his vows, including all of his brothers and lots of friends. So he did not show up by himself. Three years later, that abbey of uh, Sisto became a little bit too crowded, so they sent him off to found another abbey. Uh, it was in June of 1115, he was sent off with 12 men to create another abbey. Um, he found a wonderful place, a serene, isolated clearing known as Val d'Absente, and he called it Claire Vallée. Claire Vallée evolved eventually into Clairvaux. So that's where the Clairvaux comes in. Um, so there Bernard would preach an immediate faith of which the intercession, the intercessor was the Virgin Mary. No, this was a quote. Um, he was the founder and the first abbot of this abbey of Clairvaux. Hence his name remained forever connected to this beautiful place. The beginnings were trying. Bernard was so aus austere that he became ill. It was only his friend who came him to the rescue. His friend was, maybe his best friend, was William of Champeau, the Bishop of Chalon-sur-Marne. So Bernard had a huge following, um, and his, his friend there helped him to intervene and made it a little bit less austere. So, you know, he mitigated the austerities, and that really did the trick. He was already successful. Now he became more successful. The monastery grew rapidly. Bernard had a huge following everywhere. Disciples arrived from near and far. He was so eloquent and persuasive. His own father eventually joined the order. So there you go. Now, if you can persuade your own daddy to become a monk, that's something. Soon, all of Europe had heard from the pious abbot of Clairvaux, who was so madly in love with God and the Virgin Mary. And people came to listen to him personally or read some of his numerous writings that began to circulate throughout the theology schools and monasteries all over. Now let's look into his historical significance. In the year 1128, 13 years after Bernard had founded Clairvaux Abbey, he was so famous, he was invited to participate at the Council of Troyes, where he entered the world stage. A council is where all the bishops and kings of Europe are coming together. So there, the fervent ab abbot of Clairvaux created the outlines of the Knights Templar. That's the seal of the Knights Templar. And here's the abbey. That's how it looks today. The Knights Templar is an order that are kind of soldiers in the army of the Lord. It was kind of the key uh, group in that, what we call the Middle Ages, it was them that led all those crusades. So, and they, he kind of, you know, told them to do the first crusade. So he was basically 
the spiritual force behind that. So he founded this order, which soon became the idea of Christian nobility. They were soldiers in the army of the Lord, and Roman Catholic Christian duty was to free uh, the Holy Land of Israel from Muslim control. So without those Knights Templar, no crusades. Now, on the death of Pope Honorius II in 1130, a schism broke out in the church. King Louis VI of France convened a national council of the French bishops at Etampes, and Bernard was chosen to judge between the rivals for the Pope. So there was one uh, on one side and one on the other side, and he was the one who decides who wins. So by the end of 1131, the kingdoms of France, England, Germany, Portugal, Castile, and Aragon supported Pope Innocent. However, Italy, southern France, and Sicily with the Latin patriarchs of Constantinople, Antioch, and Jerusalem, supported Anacletus. Now, Bernard was set out to convince these other religions to rally behind innocent. And guess what? He did it. So he was literally the driving force in what was happening in Europe. Now, in 1139, Bernard assisted at the Second Council of Lateran, he subsequently denounced the teaching of Peter Abela to the Pope. So Peter Abela was a rival theologian, and there's endless to be said about their theological um, dis discrepancy. Uh, the matter between the two was ultimately settled in 1141. So Bernard soon saw one of his disciples elected to become Pope Eugene III. By then he had taught so many monks, so many, pope, uh, so many bishops and cardinals, it was natural that one of his disciples would become the pope. So having previously helped um, to end the schism between the church, uh, Bernard was now called upon to combat heresy. And that's maybe the darkest part of his history. He saw to it that the heretics in southern France were persecuted and killed, ultimately. So in June 1145, uh, Bernard traveled in southern France, and his preaching there helped strengthen, strengthen support against heresy, what, what means clearly that the Knights Templar killed all the people who were the so-called heretics. So he preached at the Council of uh, Vesele Vé in 1146 to recruit for the Second Crusade. So, but that did not go well. The Second Crusade was a miserable failure. So after the Christian defeat at the siege of Odessa, the Pope commissioned Bernard to preach the Second Crusade. The last of St. Bernard's life was saddened, well, the last years of St. Bernard's life were saddened by the failure of the Crusaders, the entire responsibility for which was thrown upon him. They started, you know, when something goes wrong, we always blame, always blame the guy whose idea it was to, be, to begin with. So St. Bernard died at the age of 63 after 40 years as a monk. He was the first Cistercian placed on a calendar of sa saints and was canonized by Pope Alexander III on the 18th of January, 1174. Uh, in 1830, Pope Pius VIII bestowed upon Bernard, Saint Bernard the title Doctor of the Church. So he was quite an important character. So now let's look a little bit into his theology, and here I really can only t tell you a little bit because we have no time. His main article was Dr. Mellifluus. Uh, if you know Latin, Melli is honey, fluus is fluent. He spoke so eloquent, his words were like honey, like flowing honey. Bernard was named a doctor of the church in 1830 at the uh, 800th anniversary of his death. Pope Pius the Twelfth issued an encyclical on Bernard, and that was called Doctor Mellifluus, in which he labeled him 
quote, the last of the fathers, of the church fathers. Bernard did not reject human philosophy, which is genuine philosophy according to him and leads to God. He differentiates between indifferent, I'm sorry, between different kinds of knowledge. The highest, of course, being theological no no knowledge. So his mellifluous, Dr. Mellifluous stuff did not deny logic, but the highest form of logic is divine logic, so to speak, theology. So the central elements of St. Bernard's Maryology, he, Mary was very important to him in every way. Um, so his Mary, Maryology is based how he explained the virginity of Mary uh, and her role as mediatrix. Mediatrix means she mediates for us to go to heaven. And I mean, medieval thoughts were kind of interesting. He's often depicted like this, and here's the Holy Mother, and here is the milk of the Holy Mother going straight into his mouth. Of course, spiritually, uh, can't take this literally. Nevertheless, this kind of imagery you find everywhere in European cathedrals. That's Saint Bernard, who gets the mi mother milk from the Holy Mother straight into his mouth. So uh, he also be developed a rich theology of sacred space and sacred music. He wrote extensively on both. And like Thomas Aquinas, he denied the doctrine of the immaculate conception of Mary. He said he had a problem with that. He said everything is based on faith. So he was actually his time about uh, uh, 500 years ahead. Uh, later on, John Calvin quotes Bernard several times in support of the doctrine of sola fide, faith alone. And of course, we know this is what Dr. Martin Luther wrote when he decided that he has to correct the Pope. That le led to the Great Fo Reformation and ultimately to the Lutheran Church. So again, he was ahead of his time and later on very important throughout theology. So you can't really study theology without coming across his name. Okay, now let's look at his spirituality. And here we have him again, here pious monk, and there is the Holy Mother. Uh, Saint Bernard was a major representative of Christian mysticism. He was instrumental in re-emphasizing the importance of Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina. Uh, Lectio Divina uh, was neglected. Uh, and when it is neglected, so he was upset about, uh, monasticism will suffer. So uh, lecti Lectio Divina, he considered Lectio Divina uh, as a contemplation guided by the Holy Spirit and is key to nourishing Christian spirituality. So you don't read the Bible or any uh, word without contemplating the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be in everything or you have nothing. That's kind of the idea behind it. Finally, um, Bernard noted even century ago, uh, centuries since him, he noted the people who are in their own, who are their own spiritual directors have fools for disciples. So he was a fervent believer in monastic teachings where you have an abbot that you work with, where you're always under very strict and rigid guidance. He thought you cannot come alone to God. That's why he hated the heretics. The heretics said, we found God right here. He's always with us. So there was basically two rivaling forms of mysticism. He had a mysticism that fit right into the church, was promoting the church. The heretics in southern France believe God is everywhere. He's right here with us. We don't need no pope. So that was the problem. So, but he was very important for uh, the idea of Christian mysticism. Finally, his legacy. St. Bernard's theology and Mariology continue to be of major importance, particularly within the Cistercian and Trappist orders because he founded them. Uh, Bernard led to the foundation of 160 three monasteries in different parts of Europe that are still around. At his death, they numbered 343. Wow. 
His influence led Alexander III, Pope Alexander III, to launch reforms that would lead to the establishment of canon law. He was the first Cistercian monk placed on the calendar of saints and was canonized by Alexander III uh, in 1174. I told you that already. Pope Pius VIII uh, bestowed on him the title Doctor of the Church, and you know that Malifluos come again. These Cistercians honor him as the founder of their order. Even Dante Alighieri noted that the man is important. He appears in his Divine Comedy as the last guide. Dante's choice appears to have been based on Bernard's contemplative mysticism, his devotion to Mary, and his reputation of just unbelievable eloquence. So that's why he's the last guide that comes. His feast day is August 20th, the day when Bernardo de Galvez was baptized. So that's his saint. So now the ultimate question, right? We want to know, what is, what is he good for, right? Is he good for anything? Here we go. This is kind of funny. He is the patron saint of beekeepers and candle makers. Well, God knows. We, are, we in St. Bernard Parish, like every, everywhere here in this region, we only need candles when the light goes out and a hurricane comes, right? So we don't have a whole lot of use for it. We like bees. Candles, well, you know, not that necessary. It's not an impossible case, right? Okay, he's the founder of the Cistercians and the Knights Templar, also the Trappists. So, of course, he is their patron saint. And then he is the patron saint of some uh, places. Like he is the patron saint of Burgundy, Burgundy, Burgundy in French, Gibraltar, Queen's College, and Cambridge. They all take him as their patron saint. He's also the patron saint of the Cathedral in Spire. That's a very important medieval a uh, city in the Rhine Valley on the German side. And they are everywhere, St. Bernard, Roman Catholic churches and monasteries throughout the world. I found a bunch of them also here in the United States. The nearest one is in Mississippi, and in there's a big one in Alabama. So now let's go back to the, our question. What do we have to do with him, and why are we not having anything about him here? Well, if these are the things that he's a patron for, no wonder there is not much use for him around here. We need candles only when the lights go out. We don't have many famous theology schools and monasteries around here in the great parish of St. Bernard. Nevertheless, I think we all can be proud of the man whose name this place is carrying. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fandrich. Do we have any questions? Did I make you all silent? I haven't seen any statues or any prayer cards anywhere here in Louisiana. He's obviously not that important. We have other priorities. Impossible cases. When you get sick, when you have a divorce, when you need a husband that, uh, that is betraying you, when you need something to eat, when you need to buy and sell a house. Come on, theology, what is it good for? Can't eat that. Make sense? We do have beekeepers in Araby. I'm sorry? We do have beekeepers in Araby. Maybe they know about oh, it. Oh, and we have Honey Island, right? And Honey Island is full of bees. It's true. It's true, but you know, not everybody can eat honey and not everybody likes bees. So, I mean, you don't need honey essentially for survival like you need St. Jude. Well, please, you know, it's a different story. <laughs> so, you know, I think our state of Louisiana was always struggling. Yeah, I mean, we had always life threatening situations where essential needs were there, primary essential needs were not met. So some fancy theologian was just not that important. But I thought he was a good person for Don Bernardo de Galvez because, I mean, Don Bernardo was a very pious man and a very powerful uh, soldier. So I think that is what he is. So he has the spirit of his patron saint for sure. A 
Absolutely. Absolutely. But I was amazed. I mean, I had never done any research on Saint Bernard until now. Of course, I knew Bernard of, of, from, of Clairvaux. I'd heard of him. But that there were seven Saint Bernards, that was quite revealing to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I knew that uh, the man after whom the dogs are named had nothing to do with Don Bernardo de Galvez. But, you know, it's all a connection. I've been on that path many times, but I didn't think of the mission of a medieval monk. So, you know, I just thought there were dogs around in that hospice there. <laughs> there you go. There's a connection after all. Now, I think they confused them because most of these guys lived at the same time. They all lived roughly at the same medieval time, were the sons of noblemen, and then went into a monastery and changed the world from the inside of a monastery. So I think they were, even the depictions, I was trying to get the, um, the saint cards for these different uh, Saint Bernards, they confused them. So like he generally has a devil on a chain and a dog somewhere. But um, which dog and which devil on a chain, you know? <laughs> I think the Saint Bernards kind of blurred into each other. But from what I remember in Europe, whether you're in, you know, everywhere in medieval, where you have medieval history, he was incredibly important. I mean, they all talk, like especially in what is now Germany, Saint Bernard was incredibly important. It's always him. So, no, more, do we have more questions? Yes. Hold on a second. I'm going to come to you with the microphone. I think I read the site of the original monastery is now a, a maximum security prison, but the monastery has been fully reconstructed or rebuilt in California. Is that right, too? Um, I don't know about California, but there's prisons everywhere, and right next to a monastery wouldn't surprise me. So <laughs> it's probably true what you heard. I don't know. I haven't done any research on prisons next to the monastery, but... There are plenty prisons in France, and high security prisons happen to be in remote places, and the monastery is clearly in a remote place, so it wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Any Anyone other else? questions? No? Okay. Thank That's you it? very much, Dr. Thank Kimmich. you all for coming. Have a nice night. I'm, I'm delighted that not only me is interested in some, some saint of the medieval time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>